All right. We're going to start a new unit. We're kind of, because we don't have a full quarter or full semester, we're not covering everything in U.S. history. So we're taking some, we're taking basically four chunks of historical time up through the Civil War to examine. This unit is called the Age of Jackson, and in particular, Andrew Jackson. It is the age, historians call it the age of the common man, and it's also the birth of the Democratic Party, the same Democratic Party we have today. So we're going to cover about a 20-year time period here in, a, in about, I think it's 28 slides. So some overview of the Jacksonian democracy. That's another name, uh, or that's a name that's been given. Thank you, Joe. Good to see you. That's a name given to what came out of the Jacksonian period, the Jacksonian democracy. So these are kind of the characteristics of the Jacksonian democracy philosophy, or worldview, or... Um, uh, political philosophy, equality of classes, meaning up to this time period, if you were a landowner, a white male landowner of 21 years of age, you're the one that got to vote. If you were poor, white male, or white male with no property, you didn't get to vote. So in the voting system, there is a class system. Well, the Jacksonian democracy, it's, one of its characteristics is equality for, well, I'll just say it, the white guy, the white man. Now, that's important because natives don't have the same quality. Free, even free blacks don't have the same right under this philosophy. But all white men do. Equality became the governing uh, principle in American society. Equal, equal opportunity for white men under Jacksonian democracy is equality for the white man. Blacks were still discriminated against. <clears throat> Another characteristic was the self-made man, the ideal um, that uh, individuals, individual men, could do acts of heroism and uh, make themselves into what they are. Uh, self, you hear this a lot with somebody who's, quote, a self-made man. Uh, typically, that's referred to somebody who's been successful. Starts out in a poor family, works hard, and, bec and becomes successful, wealthy, property, whatever. They are often seen as somebody who's a self-made man. President Obama did not like this statement in one of his campaign speeches. He said there's no such thing as a self-made man. Other help people helped the, those people get there. He rejects the Jacksonian democracy ideal in, the, in this particular point. Trump, on the other hand, embraces this ideal of a self-made man. So if I ask you what are some of the characteristics of the Jacksonian democracy, that's these right here in the next slide. And it is out of this philosophy that the Democrats still today consider themselves, they, they openly st make statements like this, that they are the common man. They're for the working man. In fact, my dad voted Democrat all of his life until President Reagan's election because the Democrats were convinced everybody they were for the working man. And at this time period, it's easy to see that this, in fact, is the case. You'll see that as, as Jackson fights the corruption that has occurred up to this point. So we're going to break this down. So let's take a look here. We've got politics of the common man. So we're going to examine this a little bit. The common man being, the we're not talking about founding father status. We're talking about the average yeoman farmer in America. Okay, yeoman farmer, if you're not familiar with that, uh, is a term referring to a small family unit who has maybe 80 acres, 160 acres, and, and they are... Uh, farmer, uh, they farm for their substance. They don't work for somebody, they work for themselves as fa small farmers. We don't have those anymore. Most farmers are some kind of corporation. There are some, what they call small family farms left, but they're still not considered yeoman farmers because everything else they, they do is relied upon by somebody else. 
even their tractor work and, and irrigation. They don't do all that themselves. And of course, if they hire their work out, as many do around here, that also is not the same. So yeoman farmers would have lots of kids, 12, 18 kids, um, in order to do the work. That's, that's very common. Uh, Jefferson thought the yeoman farmer made the perfect American because he was self-reliant. He didn't rely on other people. If he was going to eat, he was going to have to work. He didn't rely on other people. So the politics of the common man, uh, essentially, let me take a look at this real quick. I didn't write extra notes in my slide here, doggone it. Uh, let's see, but controlled through the hands of the... Oh, yes. So at this point, up in this time period, presidential candidates, vice president candidates, Senate candidates were selected by state party people. At this, and at this time period, we don't even have official parties yet. Okay? But the upper class of society would be the ones choosing their candidates to run and represent them. The, it is this time period through the Jacksonian time period, the Jackson era, where that is removed and given back or given to the people through electoral votes. So here's a good comparison. In 1824, you only had 350,000 people cast votes, or up to that time period. After 1824, 2.4 million in 1840. Many, many, many more people are participating in the democratic element of our elections. Also during this time period, <clears throat> More states allow more males to vote. In fact, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri allowed all white males to vote. By the way, there was an age limit, 21. You weren't considered full adult till 21, 18. And that's only been changed because of the Vietnam War. Why? Because 18-year-olds were being drafted. And the position is, and the, the left, anti-war people, got that changed because they wanted more 18 year olds to be anti-war and they, well shoot it, get them, if we can get them to vote, then we have more votes for anti-war. So they gained a lot more voters that way. What's amazing is most 18 year olds vote liberal, uh, democratic type policies, but when they turn 40, they start becoming more conservative. So the, the best medicine to a status person who likes big government is having a family, uh, that and a job. And then they start deciding, oh, wait a minute, I want to keep more of my money. Uh, I don't want the government dictating to my kids. Um, yeah. yeah, at 17 you can join the military. You don't get to vote, but at 18 you can vote. But, what's the, but here's the thing, guys. Think about this. They gave you the right to vote. Remember, the, those who pushed the right to vote at 18 really did not think you're adult enough. Because you can't drink, you can't buy a handgun until you're 21. They only wanted you, they extorted you for your vote, knowing most 18, 19, 20 year olds vote Democratic. <clears throat> they had no interest in your rights. Yet that's how they sold it to your grandparents. So in order to change their, or to allow more males to vote, you had that states had to change their constitutions and you started seeing that. So I've already talked about how party nomination uh, changes, changed. Uh, let's see here, I apologize, I don't have this pared down as much as I thought I did. I was working on this late last night, so I thought, I tried to give you just the nuts and bolts. I apologize, good grief. So <clears throat> again, uh, I'm just gonna paraphrase this for you. The key thing here is uh, party, uh, the upper class within the political parties uh, were, no, were not able to choose their candidates as freely. Now, there was still a lot of that going on even up until the 1940s when t with, uh, with TV bringing to light the backroom deals occurred. But um, in the people's hands, uh, the, those upper echelon of society lost a lot of control. They also started pushing for popular election of the president. Okay, At that time, states were allowed uh, voters to choose uh, the state's presidential electors. 
Okay. Before then, you could not. Uh, the party officials chose the electors. Remember, when you vote for president, you don't actually vote for the president in this country. You vote for the electors, the electoral college. And it used to be that those in the upper class would be the ones choosing the electors. Now, we get to choose them. So if you're a member of the Republican Party, you get to vote at the state conventions. Who's going to represent the party at when it's time to vote? So in November, we vote for president every four years. The Electoral College meets in December and actually cast the vote for the president. We vote for the Electoral College. They vote for the president. So that's why, even though they declare President Trump's the winner, or he's the next president, it is not a done deal until the Electoral College meets and votes. Now, in most states, it's illegal for them to choose a different uh, candidate than what the people did. But uh, some states do allow the Electoral College to choose different. I think that's only happened once. It is this time period that we officially get into a two-party system. Before then, we had a two-party system, but it was more or less unofficial. We had the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Jackson, excuse me, um, Thomas Jefferson was seen as the leader of the Anti-Federalists. More appropriately, they were called the Republicans. Not Republican Party, though. Republicans were those who supported small government, small federal government, large nation-state government as republics. That's where they get the name Republican. They were in favor of republics, not a large central government. The Federalists, George Washington, John Adams, Madison, all of those guys were in favor of a strong central government. Long story short, the Federalist wins out with the Constitution. Anti-Federalists did not want the Constitution. They thought it made too strong of a central government. And the abuses that they were worried about is what we see happening today in Congress. A identical. Identical to the things they warned us about. Uh, we get the Bill of Rights because the Anti-Federalists said, fine, if you want the Constitution approved by us, then you're going to have to write a Bill of Rights as well. And they did. And that's how they got the Constitution approved in the states that did not like it, who thought it was too strong. So we'll get to some of those issues later on the road. Oh, this is history. Government, government we're going to. All right, so we get the rise of the two-party system at the national level. We also get third parties that start coming up. But both parties really didn't like this particular group, they, the Masons. So they really started running on anti-Mason platforms. In particular, the, uh, the Democrat Party, which it's not officially named Democrat Party yet. So another thing about the Federalists and Republicans, they end up splitting between the end of Jefferson's term and this time period into a couple new parties or groups one, and one of them is called the Whigs. The Whigs are conservative individuals. Uh, they would be in some ways considered conservative today. However, they were also Federalists, which means they were for strong central government. That's what makes them contrary to today's conservatives. So they're kind of a, a mixed bag of individuals. Some of them were Republicans, Jeffersonians. Some of them were Federalists. But they've created a new party called the Whigs. They thought that the country was going too far um, away from the Constitution. So hang tight. Let me paraphrase for you. F, put down more elected officials. What do you need to know about that? Well, let's take a look here. So... They have more particular officials being elected, not appointed. So the growth of government is expanding at both the state and local levels. The next element, popular campaigning. Prior to this time period, people really didn't go out and campaign face to face. Their friends did it for them. So what would be called the surrogates would go out and campaign for them. Now you have the actual candidates going out to communities like we see today. 
The next element is the spoil system. So this idea comes out of Jack, Jack, uh, uh, Jacksonian time period, and that is, if I win the election, I have the right to remove everybody who works underneath me and replace them with my friends. Now, on one hand, that's a good thing. Because you don't want, for example, President Trump. Do you really think he, want, he wants President Obama's people working underneath him? Absolutely not. Because they are contrary. His, President Obama's philosophy is contrary to uh, President Trump's. You would not want to keep somebody underneath you who's in charge of executing your agenda who is not loyal to you. Every president does this, by the way. That's why you always see new cabinet members. They always replace their top leadership with their people. Kellyanne Conway, she was the campaign manager there towards the end of his campaign. When he won the election, she landed herself a nice job in the White House because he trusts her. She did a good job for him. She, she, he knows how she works. They've got a trust factor, so she has a job. A lot of people criticized Trump for hiring her. It's silly. Because every president does that. Every governor, we're going to have a new governor in January, he will do the same thing. He, there's a lot of people he's going to choose to keep in place. But there's also other people he's going to replace. Now, here's the bad part of this. If you replace too many or replace them too quickly, you run the risk of having people who have no idea what they're doing at that job. You have, no, you have no institutional history. And Jackson runs into this problem. He wipes out the top leadership, replaces them, which he has the right to do, but it runs amok because they don't know the job. President Trump has never ran for office before, never been in government. He is suffering from that still today. Not quite understanding how government works, and you can't run it completely like a business. That's the downside of replacing too many. Um, typically what happens is they will find somebody who is loyal to the president, to his philosophy, in the agency and promote them. But that doesn't always happen. Um, and here's the thing, President Trump did not replace all of the people. And it has cost him dearly because there's people, even this morning, there's, there's an opt-ed news, an opt-ed piece in the New York Times, supposedly somebody from his inner circle saying how bad he is. He has had to deal with this kind of betrayal since he took office because he kept too many of President Obama's appointees in place. Now, I understand why he did it because he recognized... I don't have enough of my business people who understands how these things work, so I'm going to keep them in place. But it's cost him dearly. Yes? If the Democrats take control of the House, he will be impeached. Will he be removed from office? I don't think so. If he is, look out. I think this country will be in a, a horrendous situation. Possible some people picking up arms. I think that's very possible. Yeah. How does he pass out to get That's the issue. He has done nothing. There's only two ways to get impeached. High crimes and misdemeanors. He's done nothing. He ha nothing has he done. There's been no misdemeanor committed. There's been no high crime, which is like a treasonous type act. There is nothing. And here's the problem. If the Democrats control the House, they can come up with... And here's the thing about impeachments. It's kind of it's, it's a garbage thing. <clears throat> It's an indictment is all it is. You, the president, don't even get to be there to hear it and present evidence. It's an indictment. An indictment, if so, let's say a prosecutor thinks I did something. He will go take his evidence, however he wants to present it, to the grand jury and they will indict me. I don't get to be there. My attorney doesn't get to be there. And he can create whatever story he wants. I get arrested, I get booked, I finally go to trial, and then now I get to present my evidence, and that's how I'm found not guilty. An impeachment really means nothing. Now, here's the difference between, and I say that, it means a lot for President Clinton when he was impeached, because he lied under oath, 
It was on video, and he admitted to it. And Congress did not do their job. The House impeached him, but the Senate did not convict him. Even though the evidence was there, even though he admitted to it, even though he lost his law license over it, he paid a huge fine for it, they still did not hold him accountable. President Trump has done nothing. So I don't think he'll be removed from office. But if he does, oh my God, uh, I hate to see what's going to happen. There are some people out there that will just lose their minds. But he may not be reelected too. Um, there's so much going against him. If we would set the news media aside, quit listening to it, and look at the economy, there's been nobody even coming close to his administration to see the recovery that we have under the two years he's been under. Huh? It's been almost two years. So if we would to set all that garbage aside, oh, by the way, the op-ed piece who claims to be an inside, someone who works in the Oval Office, the news is run, it's anonymous. We have no name. The news is running it like this person really does work in the Oval Office. It, he may, this person may not. It may be all garbage. And yet the news is running it for all of you to hear as if it's fact. If you would set that aside and look at the numbers. Youth unemployment, the lowest it's been in 40 or 50 years. Black unemployment, the lowest it's been in 40 years. Uh, lowest un unemployment for uh, Mexican families in, in 30 years. Lowest unemployment, uh, or yeah, the lowest un unemployment nationally in some 30 years. Uh, lowest tax rate in some 20 years. People, I mean, it's just incredible what's happening. Just from the economic perspective, we may end the Korean War, Korean War under his leadership. Um, there's a lot of absolutely terrific stuff happening, but you would never know it if you watch the news. Uh, so he may not be reelected because of what he calls fake news, and there is a lot of it out there. Um, I, I d it really depends on who he runs against. Uh, um, if he runs against Bernie Sanders, I think Trump goes back. I would love to see that, though. I would love. I would. I would have rather seen him get it. Actually, if you understand how the spoil system works. Uh, in, in the Democratic Party, Bernie Sanders should have won the nomination, not Hillary. That was, uh, like Bernie Sanders says, that was a rigged system for, for her. Um, in government A or government B, we're going to talk about how that system works and how it favors, how the Democrat Party still controls. It doesn't really matter what you all want. They still control who gets to run for president in that party. So it's, a, it's a, not a good system from a Democratic perspective. Um, but anyways, I'm not sure how we got down that road. <laughs> All right. Oh, we we're talking about spoil systems. That's right. All right. So we're going to take a look at the election of 1824. <clears throat> Four candidates ran during this election. Jackson won the most popular, won the popular vote, but not the majority in the Electoral College. You have to win the majority in the Electoral College. Now in our system, if you do not win the majority of the Electoral College, then the vote goes to the House of Representatives. They get to choose who will be president. The two main individuals here is John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son, and Andrew Jackson. You have a third individual named Henry Clay. He's the Secretary of State. Uh, he's actually ran for president more times than anybody else in our, in our history and has lost every time. But boy, he wants to be president. The... Traditional route to becoming president is you start by being Secretary of State. You become appointed to the Secretary of State. The last four presidents before Jackson here was Secretary of State before president. So they make a deal in the House of Representatives. Henry Clay would be willing to drop his claim if they elect... 
if they choose, I should say, if they vote for John Quincy Adams, because they sure don't want Jackson. No, they don't like Jackson at all. They don't want Jackson. So he, he, Clay says, tell you what, and, and I say this because, and it's in, it's in quotes, the corrupt bargain. The, what, that is reference to this deal that they made. John Quincy Adams would become president. Henry Clay will become Secretary of State, which puts him in line to run for president down the road. And by doing so, the House of Represent Representatives agree to this, knocks out Jackson, and Quincy Adams becomes the next president. Now, this is what's referred to by the Jacksonians as the corrupt bargain. And their historians are pretty sure this is exactly what took place. Um, oh, Hip Hughes here. We're going to watch a quick video here, here from Hip Hughes, um, my Marxist history buddy from New York. He does a quick little video, probably, I don't know, five or ten minutes of an overview of this election that I thought was much better than what I could present. So we'll watch that. You don't need to worry about the names. The only people you need to worry about, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson. Those are the three names. You're going to hear another name. Don't worry about him. He was a nobody, um, at least for our purposes in this class, okay? But understand what brought the, the 1824 election, four candidates. None of them got the majority electoral college vote. Jackson got the popular vote. But per our Constitution, the House of Representatives chose the president. And in a deal that was made, Quincy Adams was chosen president, and Adams selected Henry Clay as his Secretary of State, setting Henry Clay up to be president in eight years. Okay, that's, that's the rundown of this. This leaves Andrew Jackson P.O.'d, because again, he thinks... Everybody, everybody's vote should, in fact, if he could, he'd get rid of, rid of the Electoral College like Democrats would today. Every presidential election that they don't win, they immediately call out and call for the repeal of the Electoral College. Um, he does not like it and things. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're hitting you up with the election of 1824 and it's a doozy. We're looking at a new political party system, the end of the Democratic Republicans, an election that's thrown to the House of Representatives, a corrupt bargain. How much more credit can we get? So giddy up for the London guys, let's see if we can't grow your brain from times its size. So normally when I do this, guys, I introduce the candidates of each political party. But that type of nominating system is sort of dead by 1824. Previously to 1824, it was congressional caucuses that would nominate their political party's nominee for the election. But now that the Democratic Republicans are really the only party in town, they really haven't been doing that very well. And they're kind of stitched together under this era of good feelings of President James Monroe. But underneath this sheet of this beautiful political family lies factionalism and sectionalism and lots of distrust and a lot of people that want to be president. So let's look at the candidates. They're all Democratic Republicans. Now the congressional Democratic Republicans did meet. They didn't all show up to the party. And they end up nominating with their small group, William Crawford. William Crawford is the Secretary of Treasury. He's sort of a hothead. He doesn't like John Adams very much. And he's what you would call in those days a radical or a very traditionalist Democratic Republican, a Jeffersonian, he would call himself. He's against central government. Power. He's against tariffs and meddling in the economy and the National Bank. He's against this American system we'll talk about in a second that Henry Clay is proposing. He even at one time drew his cane on the President of the United States. I believe that he was chased out with a hot poker. This is a guy who just isn't really in the same mold as, say, a John Quincy Adams. And there's another candidate for you. He really is kind of an old Federalist. And, and even the old Federalists are like, I'm not a Federalist, I'm a Democratic Republican. The Adams family has switched over. And keep in mind, John Quincy Adams has been training for this his whole life. He's probably the most well-traveled president that we ever had. He spoke multiple languages. He was the minister of Russia. He was the minister to Great Britain. He had helped craft the treaty of Ghent that winded the War of 1812. He had connections all around the world, not to mention that he's part of a political dynasty in John Adams and the States, really growing up surrounded by American politics and the Constitution. 
and he is in the unique position of being the Secretary of State. Remember, Thomas Jefferson was Secretary of State and then President. So was James Madison. So was James Monroe. So by Monroe making John Quincy Adams his Secretary of State, he's kind of giving his blessings to him. And Jefferson is still around. He's blessing the anointment of John Quincy Adams. And dear old dad is still pumping away at the right old age of 88 or something. And of course, he's giving his blessings to his son as well. And he is an old Federalist. He believes in the National Bank. He believes in tariffs. He believes really in a strong central government. So he's going to be running as a Democratic Republican as well. But of course, we have other people like Henry Clay. He's the Speaker of the House. He really wants to be President Real Dad. And he's tired of waiting. He wanted to be Monroe's Secretary of State. He got snubbed by John Quincy Adams. So he really wants to be the president, and he's developed something called the American system. And the American system is basically kind of the old federalist position of tariffs, and not only a strong economic system like a national bank, but also investment in infrastructure. And of course, this is mostly going to aid the Northeast and some of the uh, Midwest and the areas that he comes from, like Kentucky. So he is for a strong central government as well. Now, we have one more cat on the stage here, meow, and that's Andrew Jackson. Now, if you thought Crawford was a hothead, Andrew Jackson is going to blow them all up. Andrew Jackson was killed people in duels, and later when an assassin tries to assassinate him, he beats him with his cane. He's going to have a strong southern regional support system. Of course, he's the hero in the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans. He rides that into political office. He served as the governor of the territory of Florida. He was a House member from Tennessee. He's now a senator. Now he wants to be president as well. So we're going to put all these four guys in a mix, and they're going to be fighting the electoral contest to get more than half. You know, there's 261 electoral votes. You have to get 131 electoral votes to be president. And these are very regional candidates. John Adams is the Northeast. You have William Crawford, who's kind of the eastern, southern part of the United States. You have Andrew Jackson, who has strong support not only in the mid-Atlantic states, but the southern states and some of the western states. And you have Henry Clay, who's pulling in western states as well. So let's put these guys in the electoral blender and see who comes out on the <laughs> Vice presidency is easy. That's John Calhoun. He kind of ran unopposed. They didn't run on the same ticket back then. But for president, we have a major split of Rama. And like we said before, it's going to be regional. If you look at the Electoral College map right there, you can see that the color coding makes it very obvious that, that these candidates are drawing from distinct populations based on where they come from. So you have John Quincy Adams, who's locked up seven states in the Northeast. He's going to pull out 84 electoral votes. And even though not all states have a popular vote, of that popular vote, he gets about 31% of the vote. Now, if you look at Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson has the most widespread support across different states. He's going to win the most states, 12 states. But he's really racking up votes not only in the West and, of course, in the South, but he's also racking up mid-Atlantic states like Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Maryland and Delaware. And then you have William Crawford and Henry Clay. These guys aren't getting as many electoral votes. William Crawford only pulls in two states. That would be his home state of Georgia and Virginia. 41 electoral votes and about 11% of what was the popular vote. Another factor about William Crawford that's going to hurt him in the election is in 1823, he kind of suffered a massive stroke. So he's running through this election you know, with his health not in the best tip-top shape. Not only is that bad for campaigning, although they really didn't campaign, their surrogates campaigned. And that's true in these elections. The campaigns are occurring through political cartoons, even some songs at this point. Andrew Jackson has a song. But Jackson, he was wide awake and was not scared at trifles. So well he knew what aim we take with our Kentucky rifles. So he led us down to Cypress Swamp. The ground was low and mucky. There stood John Bull in martial pomp. And here was old oh, Kentucky, old oh, Kentucky. The hunters of Kentucky, old oh, Kentucky. The hunters of Kentucky. And then you have Henry <laughs> Clay with 37 electoral votes. Turn that into a rap, and couldn't you? Kentucky and <laughs>
going to go to the House of Representatives where the rules are a little bit different. Every state is going to get one vote in this new electoral college that's going to occur in the House of Representatives. Now, each state's going to determine that vote based on their own state legislatures. So some of them are going to have popular elections. Some of them are going to vote by state legislatures. Some of them are going to let the electors make up their own minds. But basically, it's going to come down to 24 states. Whoever gets the most states wins. So are you ready for a corrupt bargain? Because that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Adams, who only won seven states in the Electoral College, is now going to win 13 states in this House of Representatives race. Andrew Jackson, who won 12 states, is only going to get seven states in this new vote. And William Crawford is going to rack up four states at the end of the day. So what did John Quincy Adams do? Well, most historians believe that he made some type of deal with Henry Clay. Remember what Henry Clay always wanted? He wanted to be president, now he can't be. Well, what would you want to be if you couldn't be president, but you wanted to be president next time around? I want to be Secretary of State. So John Quincy Adams is going to give him the Secretary of State position, and whether it's a quid pro quo or not, he's going to get Henry Clay's states, including Kentucky, including Ohio, including Missouri. And three states which originally went for Andrew Jackson, Louisiana, Maryland, and Illinois, they're going to switch their votes to John Quincy Adams as well. So John Quincy Adams, you're the next president of the United States. Andrew Jackson, you're mad as hell. And 1828 is going to be sweet revenge for Andrew Jackson. So once Andrew Jackson nudges away this William Crawford guy, you know, the guy with the stroke, he's going to have control of a new political party, the Democratic Party, which is going to be a break away from the Democratic Republican Party. What's going to happen to those old Democratic Republicans that came from the Federalist Party in the North? They're going to kind of splinter first into a National Republican Party and then into the Whig Party. So the arrow of good feelings is way done as we enter into a new partisan political part of American history. Give me up for the learning. All right. John Quincy Adams. This is an actual photograph of him. Much later in life, he didn't quite look like this when he was president, but this is what he looks like. Looks a lot like his dad. Looks a little grumpy there. Like his dad. <laughs> I believe he is the first president to have his photo taken. They didn't have cameras. Yeah, they did paintings. Oh, that's it, but like this is like the first. Yeah, this is like an 1850s picture. Yeah, first pictures weren't until 1850 something. He got sick. We don't really know what he got sick of or sick with. No, never got a scratch in battle. All right, so President uh, 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 Quincy Adams here. So one of the things, him being a a strong centralized government type of guy. Um, strong centralized, strong federal government loves taxes. <clears throat> He's really no different. He likes tariffs. Tariffs are taxes on imports. So anything coming into the country, it's taxed because it's being imported in. We have tariffs on, our, on products coming into our country. Good example, the 1980s, early 80s, Japan was able to make Hondas and other cars very cheap, making it where uh, Ford and GM and Chevy and, and all of those American makers could not compete with the price. So America put tariffs on Japanese cars, making them more, and therefore would raise the price, making them more price competitive to American cars. What they couldn't do was make them more dependable. Uh, Japanese cars, Honda, Honda in particular, are terrific long-running cars. I've got a Honda myself, over 300,000 miles on it. Toyota's another one. I have a Dodge pickup, <clears throat> five years younger, I have a hun not even 150,000 miles on it, I doubt I'll see it 160. Yet my Honda, I've, the only thing I've had to do to it is replace the transmission. Other than that, the engine's still going. I got CV joint set. Dylan has to fix for me this year, but the engine will last a long, long time for a gasoline engine. So tariffs, and of course, what's been in news recently is President Trump has placed tariffs 
on different products from different countries. China, for example, uh, there's tariffs on products coming from, from Europe. There's tariffs coming on, uh, been placed on stuff from Canada. He's doing that in an effort to force them to, to enter into better trade deals with us. So far, it's been working. China, China has raised their tariffs on us. We've raised on them, but they can't hold out as long as we can. Europe, they quickly changed their tune, came to the United States, made a deal with President Trump, and now we've lowered tariffs on some of their products. So, and likewise, they've done for us. So, tariffs are often used as a mechanism to force another country to make their products cheaper for, for the other, for the receiving com uh, country. <clears throat> In this case, it is the federal government's mechanism of collecting taxes on imported goods. <clears throat> Keep in mind, in, our, in the economy back then, raw materials was created and shipped from the south. Finished products were coming in from other, like Great Britain and or from the north. So finished products is what's being taxed with these tariffs. And this particular tariff, the tariff of abominations, abominations, it's what the South Carolina, South Carolinians, Carolinians called it. Before we get there, though, and I'm, that's I guess the main thing about about Quincy Adams. But during the 1828 uh, election, uh, let's see. You know, I don't want to do that. I want to. All right, we're going to get back to these tariffs here in a minute. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little out of order here. Okay, 1828 elections. That was a doozy. If you think, if you think this last election and the way President Trump runs things is crazy, you haven't, you don't know history. When I watched them complain about it this morning on the news, I'm like, you don't know Andrew Jackson and the 1828 election. Why don't you hold tight there, and we'll get there. So Adams, of course, wants to be reelected. Jackson wants to be elected. He's got to get more Southern votes. So the Jacksonians, not necessarily Jackson himself, but his supporters, starts a rumor in order to gain some votes. Started a rumor against John Adams. Now there's a lot of conspiracy about what those rumors are. We're not exactly for sure what those rumors are. Hip Hughes here will talk about it here a little bit. But the bottom line is with all the hoopla, that, and it was a battle. I mean it really makes the Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump look like a cakewalk. It's a wonder people weren't called out and shot in duels, especially with Jackson. Jackson has no problem dueling it with you. He's been shot before. He shot several people during duels because he got that somebody got mouthy with him. And he, oh yeah, well put your money where where your mouth is. Let's step outside. And um, he's so skinny that when he when you turn sideways, like apparently he's real hard to hit. And um, in fact, that's often what would happen. Uh, another time he was shot in the chest and was still able to return fire and killing his opponent. So he, he's one tough dude, and he has no problem going toe to toe with you. Stay in order. We're 1828. Clearly, he's not going to die before the election. Hold tight. All right. So, long story short, Jackson does win the election. He only, uh, Adams only has one term. He has only one term in office. There we go. All right, let's do a quick review, uh, overview on, on the election. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. I know you're excited because I'm excited because I'm ready to give it to you. It's the election of 18. Ladies and gentlemen. Andrew Jackson is mad as hell. He's back. He's heading for the White House. Let's take a look at the candidates. Let's take a look at the election issues. Let's take a look at the electoral results. And let's take a look at the 
in a few minutes we're all going to go. He's no longer around in 1828 to run, and his voters are kind of going to get split between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. But in terms of nominations and caucuses, there really isn't a formal nomination process. There's no primaries and voting that way. Congressional caucuses aren't really nominating people. So it's really state legislatures that are doing it. And as early as Some of the Henry Clayers that are out west, Kentucky, Missouri. Um, so he's having a lot of support in the southern part of the United States and the western part of the United States. And if you remember in 1824, he had a lot of support in the Mid-Atlantic states as well, when states like New Jersey and Maryland. Now we also have, of course, the sitting president, John Quincy Adams. You have to think of him more as an old federalist. He has most of his support in the Northeast. And it's really in this election going to be those mid-Atlantic states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, even New York, that are going to determine who's going to be the next president. Now, one thing that has fundamentally changed is the amount of people that were going to vote. In 1824, it's only about 3% of the population really property only white males. Now we're going to have all white males that are eligible to vote for the most part in most states. So about 3% is going to jump up to 9%. And out of the 24 states, 22 states this time are going to actually have popular votes. Only Delaware and South Carolina did not have a popular vote. It's their state legislatures that are picking their electors. So really this is, in a sense, the first modern popular vote-based electoral college election that we're going to have in the United States. Now in terms of vice presidents, we have John Calhoun, the sitting vice president, who's a southerner with John Quincy Adams. He's going to jump ship. He's going to go to Andrew Jackson and run as his vice president. And John Quincy Adams is going to pick up Richard Rush from Pennsylvania to run on his ticket. Now that we have our candidates, let's take a look at the actual campaign itself, and then we'll take a look at the electoral results. Pay attention, please. Could be a pop quiz at any moment. The dirty stuff, and there's a lot of dirty stuff. This is really one of the nastiest campaigns, at least since 1800. And maybe one of the nastier ones in the history of the American Republic. But the big political issue of the day isn't slavery so much yet. That's on the horizon, but it's really tariffs. And this is going to split the country between the Northeast and the West and the rest of the country in the South. Tariffs are, of course, tax on imports, and John Quincy Adams is a big believer in tariffs. That's where his base is. He wants to protect manufacturers. He wants to make sure that Americans are buying the goods that are being pumped out by American manufacturers rather than manufacturers coming from overseas. So they slap on in the tariff of 1828 a 60% tariff tax. That's a killer for people that are in the South that are buying these products. They're now being forced to buy American goods. And of course, Western farmers, they're fine with this because their raw materials are being manufactured in the United States and they're still making good money. So for Southerners, it's the worst thing ever. And for Northeasterners and Westerners, it's looking pretty good. So that's really going to split the country in terms of factions on economics. 
where John Quincy Adams is going to win most of those northeastern states, and we're going to see Jackson winning those southern and those western states, but again, those mid-Atlantic states acting as swing states. Now, it is a nasty election. I don't want to say who started it first. What a ridiculous argument that is. He started it first. The first attacks really come out of the John Quincy Adams camp. I'm not saying that he started it, but we'll start there with a series of handbills called the Coffin Handbills. There were 27 of them. These are direct attacks on Andrew Jackson. The first one um, had six coffins on it, referring to the six soldiers that he executed during the Creek War at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, where Andrew Jackson executed six American soldiers and massacred, killed 800 out of 1,000 red sticks in that battle. Now, there were other pamphlets. One of them accused Andrew Jackson of being an adulterer with his wife. That's right, his wife, Rachel, who he married, I believe, in 1790, and she wasn't formally divorced in 1793, so for two years, he was shacking up with a married woman. Ooh, how about that? Some dirty politics going on. And one of the other handbills actually accused Andrew Jackson of cannibalism, of eating dead Native American corpses. Um, so they're pretty, pretty nasty. And Andrew Jackson, he's going to respond pretty forcefully. He's going to accuse John Quincy Adams of being a pimp. He was minister of Russia, and he accuses him of giving a young serving girl to the czar as kind of a sexual prize. And he claims that's why he was such a good negotiator, such a good diplomat, because he was a pimp, and he's a gambler. That he was buying gambling equipment for the White House at taxpayers' expenses. No, he wasn't. He spent his own money, and it was a billiards table and a chess game. But just like today, you know, there's a lot of unfounded charges, a lot of slime that's being thrown around. John Quincy Adams by August stops writing in his diary, takes the higher road, engages in none of it. He feels as though it's just kind of, kind of cray cray. Andrew Jackson dives 15 layers deeper into it, writing his own editorials and newspapers and responses to the charges and accusing John Quincy Adams personally of some of this stuff. Now, one of the bigger endorsers of the day was kind of the elder Thomas Jefferson, who's still around. He's going to die in 1826, but there were many kind of uh, correspondence and letters and newspaper articles that talked about who he would endorse, and he kind of flip-flopped on the issues. There's some evidence that he was fond of Andrew Jackson and his philosophies, and there's a lot of other evidence that thought that he was more of a demigod, that he was power-hungry, and that he was really only interested in himself and not the country. But either way, we now have our two candidates. We have a very dirty campaign, and now we're ready for some electoral results. Here we go. So the election is over and Andrew Jackson is the clear-cut winner. You need 131 electoral votes. There were 261. Andrew Jackson is going to rack up 178 electoral votes to John Quincy Adams only winning 83 electoral votes. And as you can see on the electoral map, we have a clear regional split here. The Northeast is solidly in the pocket of John Quincy Adams and the National Republicans. And the rest of the country, they've gone the way of the Democrats. Really, the biggest swing states are going to be Pennsylvania and New York, both going for Andrew Jackson with a total of 48 electoral votes. If John Quincy Adams had won those two states, he'd be president of the United States. In terms of the popular vote, there's a huge expansion of the popular vote with over a million people voting in this election. Uh, John Quincy Adams is only going to rack up 43.6% of the vote with about half a million votes. And Andrew Jackson is going to run away with 642,000 Votes. So let's clean it out, guys. We're going to cut the aftermath and say goodbye. So the aftermath. Well, one thing is Rachel Jackson dies. Andrew Jackson's wife died three days after the election, and Andrew Jackson always blamed the election and the people that were kind of you know going after their marriage and accusing him of being an adulterer. So he really is going to Washington D.C. with a huge chip on his shoulder. Refuses to meet with John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams refuses to go to Andrew Jackson's inauguration. So it really is kind of a huge sign of the partisan times. Those era of good feelings are way, way. See, gone. President Obama. They went to each other's inauguration. So it's we've seen it worse. Kind of swarmed the White House, knocked over furniture. They destroyed the rugs and, and taken stuff. It was crazy. I heard John Quincy Adams had to go out the back door. They ended up putting rum punch on the front lawn to get all of his supporters out of the White House. Now, according to the Federalists, the old Federalists and the National Republicans, this is kind of the sign of the times that the common people have taken over. It's the tyranny of the majority. Fed Kent, baby. And of course, Andrew Jackson 
is saying that this is democracy and a democratic republic and he is the new victor. Now, of course, things are going to get very interesting. Andrew Jackson is going to end up supporting a lot of the tariffs that his supporters hate so much. That's going to lead to a huge nullification crisis with South Carolina in 1832 and a huge falling out with his vice president. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll have to wait for another election video.